All righty. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Molly Arend, and I'm with Balchem Animal Nutrition and Health. Thank you for joining us here today. As the global leader in choline production, chelation, and encapsulation technology, Balchem Animal Nutrition and Health strives every day to deliver results that you can see in your animal's productivity and bottom line. With a passion of animal nutrition, we are intense advocates for our customers and the animals they feed. Balchem delivers success backed by years of proven science. Our products are some of the most extensively researched in the industry, further supported by on-farm results. We deliver real results that you can count on, results that exceed your expectations, and deliver volume to your bottom line. Bal Balchem is here to solve today and shape tomorrow. On the behalf of Balchem, I'd like to now introduce our next speaker. Phil, F Phil Floud is president of Ever Ag Insights. He has been involved in the dairy and commodity market analysis, research and forecasting, consulting and risk management activities for more than 25 years. Phil draws on that experience to lead an expert team helping clients find better ways to do business across the supply chain and around the world. He is a popular speaker who engages in audiences on a variety of different topics. A resident of Cottage Grove, Wisconsin, Phil also serves on the board of directors of the Madison Public Library Foundation. Let's now welcome Phil. Uh, thank you very much. So who was here last year and saw Craig Culver talk? Can anybody tell me who shared the podium with Craig Culver? Well, yeah, he was your boss too. Um, so when Nicole called me this year and said, hey, Phil, love it if you come down to Dairy Strong, give a talk about Dairy Markets Outlook. And I said, you know, that's great. I have one condition. I will not share the platform with Craig Culver. And it's not that I'm an egomaniac, but if you went to that session last year, my boss, Scott Sexton, was on that panel, as was Chad Vincent, the head of the Wisconsin Milk Marketing Board, or whatever they called themselves today. They gave their bit, not one question, right? Hey, Craig, how are the crinkle fries cooking these days? Hey, Craig, you know, tell me about the ketchup packs. And it was very interesting. But I said, you know, I don't want to be with, you know, either like one of the Zeitlow brothers from Quick Trip or Craig Culver. I really don't think, you know, I, I just don't have, my ego would get crushed. So I'm happy to be here alone. Uh, I'm glad you came to see me. And I'm glad that Craig is making burgers someplace. So thank you very much uh, for being here. I'm going to take a round tour, uh, a world tour today. We're going to start off with uh, a little talk about some big picture dairy things. And then we're going to go into a little bit of 2023 outlook. And we'll save questions for the end. I guess I'll start. I you should have had this slide up. Um, Ever Ag represents um, my business was Blooming and Associates, uh, the old rice dairy business, commodity risk management group. Um, so we've all kind of come together under the Ever Ag, dairy.com. Uh, under the Everag umbrella. So we've been involved in risk management and dairy market analysis for a long time. I want to start today with some good news. Um, the death of dairy has been you know, wildly exaggerated. And when we think about the dairy industry and we read these stories about, oh, you know, milk is dying, um, it's really not true. The per capita consumption of dairy last year in 2021 uh, jumped up quite a bit, did pretty well. And we've had some ebbs and flows over the years. But going back to 1982, we were at about 550 pounds per person. And that's grown to about 650 pounds per person last year. So from an overarching consumption perspective, the dairy story is positive. Now, it's not positive in every category. But you can see total cheese, nice. Butter consumption, I mean, butter went from certified killer to popular. Yogurt's flattened out a little bit. Ice cream is, is, has lost ground. So it's not universal, but cheese has been the real powerhouse uh, over the years. Um, and so, you know, as, look, if people are telling you that milk is dead, they're wrong. It's, it's, it's pretty simple. And if you, if you were to plot out the pounds of milk that go into cheese versus the pounds of milk that go into what we're going into fluid milk, cheese has replaced all the pounds lost in the bottle, and we'll talk about fluid milk in a second. And the other good news story for dairy production these days is that retailers love cheese and butter promotions. 
Um, again, this is another thing that's kind of a shakeout from the days where we used to use a gallon of milk as a, a traffic driver. Well, now we're using butter and cheese. So if you look here in the middle, I mean, the price of butter last year got to three and a quarter at the CME. And as late, I think this was Kroger, I can't remember when this was exactly, but this was late summer. This was, I mean, late into the year, we saw some pretty aggressive loss leader promotions on products like butter and cheese at $1.47 a pack when, you know, cheese was pretty expensive commodity-wise. And look at those, uh, 2023 is early yet. If you look at that big jump in 2022, butter promotions and cheese promotions. So retailers know that consumers like butter and cheese and it will attract them into their store. That's, other, that's another good news story from a dairy products perspective. Inevitably, we end up talking about milk in the bottle. And we can have a moment of silence if you wish, but I think that this is not as big a deal as I think people, it's, it's emotional, but if you just look at the numbers and look what's going on, it's explainable and it hasn't been as big a disaster as you might think. So yeah, fluid milk sales down 4% in 2021. They're down 2.3% through November of this year. It's only 19.5% of milk production in 2021 compared to 34% 20 years ago. Alt milk had a 10% share of beverages, beverage milk sales in 2021. It's actually down 2% in 2022. So the, all the, the plant alternatives or whatever, they actually went backwards in 2022 for the first time in a long time. It didn't help conventional milk though. I mean, we went down too. So um, who here thinks that soy milk is the biggest problem that fluid milk has encountered? Yeah, it's not. It's 10% market share. One of the things that, this, I borrowed this from DMI with permission. Um, I find this pretty remarkable, this slide, that shows beverage alternatives going back to the 1970s. So I grew up in the 70s and 80s, and that, I mean, that's pretty accurate, right? I mean, we didn't have, bottled water wasn't such a, was, a, was not a thing in the 70s, as best I can remember. Maybe in the 80s a little bit. But I mean, we basically had milk, soft drinks, coffee, and juice. And now, if you just look at today, all the alternatives that are available to the American consumer, a plethora of choices. Some, I mean, are, you know, I mean there's, that aren't related, many that, that are, um, but we've we just given consumers a lot more choices, and they're shopping more broadly. The biggest problem, though, is still not on this slide. The biggest problem for fluid milk is that its best friends got in trouble. This crowd here got sent to sugar jail. And here's the thing. Pouring a bowl of cereal takes a lot of effort, doesn't it? I mean, you have to get a bowl, you have to get a spoon, you have to get the milk, you have to sit down, you have to clean up. And for today's modern consumer, it's a lot of hassle. And if you want to talk about the single biggest problem that fluid milk has encountered over the past 15 to 20 years, it's been that cereal has gotten in trouble. And this is a remarkable graph. The orange bar is cereal, the greenish bar is milk. It is the same trajectory. We are down about 30 a little more than 30% on cereal by volume since 2009. We're down about 26, 27% on fluid milk by volume since 2009. So, what's the solution? I don't, I don't know. Um, I would say maybe a box of Lucky Charms in every cabinet. Um, you know, I grew up on sugared cereal. I turned out okay. Um, it was good. But um, I just think it's gonna be hard to put this genie back in the bottle. And I think that when you look at the, you know, when you look at the choices that consumers have today, you know, all these choices, I just think, eh, it's gonna be hard to come back. It doesn't mean we don't try. It doesn't mean that it's impossible. But the trends are pretty clear. Unless we see cereal have a comeback. Uh, and you know, during COVID, people stayed home, they rediscovered cereal, it was a nice little blip. And then that, evaporated once we started leaving the house again. 
What's the other thing that's true about the fluid milk business in the United States over the past five to 10 years? Would you rather sell a gallon, if you were, if you were Phil's Dairy Company, and you said, I'm taking milk in today, what would I rather do? Would I rather sell you a gallon of milk or a pound of cheese? What would I rather do? Okay, fair enough. The margins stink, right? It's a low margin commodity business. It's so low margin and commoditized that what's happened in the past five to 10 years? I mean, the biggest players have gone bankrupt, right? It's not a great business. And so I think from an industry perspective, we'd much rather have people in Korea eating pizza with US mozzarella on it then, I mean, that's a victory. There's margin in that, there's growth in that. And yes, we can, we can lament the loss of fluid milk gallons. I mean, that's fine and it's real. But I just think that at the end of the day, as sad as it is, it's not where we're gonna make money. As an industry, I get it that the federal order system says it's the milk that's most, worth the most. But anyway, I just find that this chart to me is fascinating. You know, it is, it is, you know, you want, you want the autopsy? Here's the report. So I'll move on to other topics, larger topics. Um, you know, consolidation, it, it remains a thing. Down to less than 30,000 operations in 2021. We'll get the 2022 numbers before too long. I guarantee you they'll be smaller. Uh, the average herd side is up to 316 head. That's up from 179 in 2011. Um, and setting aside the angst around you know, consolidation and losing farms and all that, which I get, I just think that there's an interesting sustainability story in here, kind of you know, oddly enough, that the dairy industry, since 1950, milk production is up 94% with 50% fewer cows. So one of the things that we're doing in the US is we are super productive and we keep getting more productive. And we're investing in genetics to get even more productive yet. So we are getting a lot out of our cows. And I think that trend, that, that trend is not over anytime soon. And I think it's an argument in the larger global context of sustainability and where are you gonna grow milk production, the environmental questions. I think that in an odd sort of way, our scale is an advantage for the US versus other countries. And I mean, they don't have 500 cow dairies, many of them anywhere, anyway, elsewhere in the world, maybe New Zealand. But I mean, you talk about in Europe, you say, oh, well, you know, I was on this 1,000 cow dairy the other day. They've never heard of such a thing, right? I think that we have a much more productive footprint here in the United States, which I think is an advantage. I think that as it sits today, general farm finance is in an okay place especially in the Midwest. Um, this, these charts show, net, this is USDA data, they recently updated it. Net US farm income in 2022, that's net income at a record level. And even with as small a government contribution as we've seen, um, farm sector debt to equity ratios, not out of control. I think the mood is only so-so if you look at the Purdue um, expectations or sentiment index, I think, you know, I think inflation's a problem for farmers. I think labor is a problem for farmers. I think land cost is a double-edged sword. Yay if I own it, you know, boo if I wanna have it, or there's intergenerational questions. But I would say as we stand here at the beginning of 2023, US agriculture, generally speaking, not every farm in every neighborhood of every type, but generally speaking, U.S. agriculture is not in a terrible place. Now, $20 milk and $7 corn or $6.50 corn you know, gets you that big jump in income. And I think the costs are gonna be more, you know, the costs were only partially a factor in 2022. I think the costs become more fully impactful in 2023, so that net number is gonna be under more pressure. But 2022 was by and large a good year and I think dairy farms, by and large, a good year in 2022. And then I'll just spend a minute on this. I would say that one of the things that we've seen evolve in the dairy sector, I think for the good, although I have a dog in the fight, 
is that you know, the practice of risk management continues to evolve. Uh, dairy farmers have access to more and better risk management tools today than they've ever had. You know, conventional futures and options activity is off its highs, but still up. Uh, the dairy margin coverage program, I think, is great uh, for farms of, you know, I think it's meaningful for farms of up to about 250 to 300 head. It's a real, it's a pretty good put option for farmers. And then this dairy revenue protection insurance program has been really amazing to watch how that's unfolded over the past three to five years. We've gone from something that didn't exist in 19, I'm sorry, in 2018 to about 25% of US milk production covered under that umbrella in 2022. And about 20% maybe for first quarter of 2023. And I think that for the first quarter of 2023, we will see indemnities paid out under this program. So I think this is all good news from a dairy farmer and financial sustainability perspective. And I think what's really cool is that the tools, you know, we, we never dealt with futures and options with, with 225 cow farms because it's hard to do. DMC is perfect. When you start talking about larger operations, futures and options, forwards, and the DRP is really, really solid. All right. That's the general industry overview. I think we're in, a, we're in okay shape. It's shaky, it's the dairy industry, but by and large, I think 2022 will, will go down as a pretty good year for dairy farmers, and a year for dairy processors, uh, a pretty good year for agriculture in general. When we th start thinking about 2023, I've, I've isolated three factors to talk about here today. Uh, the first is milk production. And there's a lot of moving pieces here. If you look at you know, milk production in 20, late 2021, prices went down. We started to lose cows. If you look you know, in uh, late 2021, we were down 70,000 cows. We got close to minus 100,000 cows over here uh, in April. Uh, milk production was negative for several months in a row. Uh, that would be the graph on the left. Um, and so we had the less money meant less milk side of the cycle. And now I think we're kind of, we flipped that around to the more money means a little bit more milk side of things. You know, margins got better as the year went on. We saw $20 milk prices. We saw $12.50, $13 .00 DMC margins. And we've seen milk production bounce back up. So we've been up five months in a row. Nothing major, um, not in the danger zone, but certainly more milk. And now we have cow numbers up on a year over year basis. And as I said, more money usually means more milk. If you look at this graph on the right, the margin, the DMC margin for 2022 is gonna be about 1070 on average. And when we've been around 1070 or higher, milk production has never been less than 1% higher and has been as much as 4% higher historically. So, I mean, it's not, it's not a radical, profound concept we're talking about here. Dairy farmers make money, they make more milk. And so, the question is, how much more and for how long? And I think here, the calculus has changed in a pretty profound way. Um, first off today, forward-looking margins are deteriorating again. So the graph on the left, on the right, I'm sorry, shows, does this, there we go, shows that you know, this in the spring, early summer of 2022, we see the, saw these margins get up over $12. Those are pretty healthy. I think that spurred things along. But now, you know, we're down all the way. Futures prices have come down off their highs and grain prices have stayed steady. And now, as of last week, we were under, seven, uh, under $8 on that forward-looking margin. Not nearly as exciting from a dairy farm profitability perspective. This is interesting too. I've never seen the gaps this wide. When you look at the cost of production and farm margins, so, I mean, everybody did okay here in 2022, these orange bars. But if you look at the cost of production between California and Wisconsin, right now we estimate that California is running more than $3 higher cost of production than California. California's running $3 above Wisconsin. How many times has that happened in our lifetime? I don't think it has, to be honest with you. We talked to legitimate, I mean, we talked to good dairy producers in California, and they say their cost of production is $22 per hundredweight or higher. 
And there's, there's a Fraser and Torbert. One of the accounting firm's data kind of backs that up, uh, that those numbers are high. And when we talk to our better clients in the Midwest, I mean, whatever, the more, uh, the guys who watch it closely, uh, they would tell you that right now for 2023, they figure that they're at 1850. Um, validating the numbers that we get from our models. So I think that when we look at where is milk production going to grow, it's more likely in the Midwest than it's going to be in the West. It's not going to be Idaho. It's not going to be California. It's not going to be, I mean, Texas will continue to grow for other reasons, but the growth potential is more in the Midwest. The East had a good year last year too, but there's limitations there. So one of the reasons that we're not going to grow all that much is there aren't any replacement heifers. We'll get a new January number here at the end of this month. We'll get a January 2023 number. But when you look at the July heifer inventory numbers, uh, we were at uh, just over 3.7 million heifers. Uh, we were at less than 40% ratio to dairy cows. And that's the lowest numbers. They didn't report in those couple of years of the government was closed or what. But you know, we're at the lowest level by those measures in eight or nine years. So even if you said, hey, look, you know, times are great. I'm going to expand my herd. I want to, I want to grow a little bit. The animals have been, are scarce, and they're relatively expensive. That's a barrier to growth. The other barrier to growth is we've seen the emergence of a number of um, what are called, we call base excess programs, um, where different agencies or co-ops have said, look, we're going to have smart growth here. We're not going to have unfettered growth. And so in times gone by, you could make as much milk as you wanted and someone would pick it up. And now over the past three to five years, we've seen that tighten up quite a bit. You can't add cows in Idaho today because the processors are full and they've told the farmers, look, you can ship us X. If you ship us X plus, you know, you're going to pay for the disposal cost of the plus if we can't use it. So there's been no real expansion in Idaho uh, cows or plants for a little while. Um, the same thing is true in the Southwest. Now, the Southwest Agency, which is sort of a group of cooperatives, has a pretty stringent limit on it. There are people that are operating outside the agency who, that are growing. Um, but for the most part, if you're in one of the three, or four, three co ops down there, you can't add cows. Or if you produce too much milk, you get penalized. Uh, the Northeast, very stringent restrictions. A little bit in the Mideast. We don't see much of it here in the Midwest. Uh, there's not much, there's, I think everybody's got a plan in their desk and they're ready to take it out and put it on the desk if they feel like things have gotten too long. Uh, there's been enough expansion around the edges to, uh, plant expansion around the edges to support more cows. Um, but for the most part, so the most part, the Midwest is kind of free territory. Um, but it's hard to grow milk production under, the, under these programs. As far as the cost on the, on the grain side, um, you know, the war in Ukraine has had a big impact. Uh, we saw prices spike earlier in the year when, when the Russia rolled into town. We came down, but we're kind of back middle of the ground on, on corn, beans, kind of you know, $15. Soy meal was under $400 for about 15 minutes one day uh, in September, I think, or October. Uh, it's back up over 450. And so the balance sheets are tight. Um, exports are in question for now, but yeah, you know, and we're watching the South American weather. But I feel like we're a long way from $5 corn. I just don't see how, you know, maybe we maybe we feel great in July. Crop in the ground, everything's going great. All those, things, you know, all those things could happen. But between here and there, I don't think we're going to see much cheap corn or cheap soybeans. Um, I think that, I don't know if this is bullish or bearish. I think this is kind of bullish at the end of the day, that you know, money managers got out of the market. So managed money got out. So when you look back at, at this drop here in these markets, that was managed money leaving town. But now the funds, they're kind of back in, but they're not all the way in. They're kind of deciding what to do. I think that the currency trades, the global macro trade, all those things are impacting decisions. But if, if, if the funds want to get long corn again, I think we'll notice it in the current environment. 
And they're not, it's not like they have a big position. They were double where we are today, not so long ago. So this is potentially bullish. And then the drought, um, I think this picture's gotten a little bit better. It'll be very interesting to see what California looks like in this week's report uh, tomorrow at, on Thursday. Um, but you can see this drought has kind of crept across the country a little bit, and it's getting close to our neighborhood. Uh, when you look at milk cow areas experiencing drought, this is last year at this time, 47%. This year, we're at 45%. Not much different. I mean, some of these areas have gotten like, you know, oh, look at this area here. It's gotten a lot better but, you know, compared to last year. But there aren't many cows right here, right? I mean, that's like, oh, yeah, I mean, how many cows are in Utah? Not a ton. So I think that's a challenge. I think South American weather is a challenge. Uh, right now, I think Brazil seems to be sneaking through on the good side. Uh, I think Argentina's got trouble. Uh, their crop planting is about 10% behind normal. There's talk of abandoned acres. Uh, USDA gave the uh, Argentine soybean crop a pretty big haircut last week, and private forecasts are, are looking for less yet. So South America, you know, mixed. Maybe, you know, I think Brazil can make up for some Argentina shortfalls. But we're not going to get a send corn to 450 or send beans down to $10 kind of crop out of South America in the next couple of months. So on the balance sheets globally and the U.S., there just isn't a lot of room for error. You know, corn stocks, you know, lowest since 2011. Soybean stocks, lowest since I think 2012 or 13. So not much room for error. And I just think that you know, for the next six months, it's gonna, we're gonna be two something somewhere every day. We're gonna be too wet to plant, too dry to plant, too something. And I, don't, I, mean, I think it's gonna take until July uh, before we have any, if, if things are going fine, I think we're not gonna believe it until July, right? We kill the corn crop three times between planting and harvest, um, and um, you know, in the marketplace anyway. So we'll see how it plays out. So I just don't think that grains are gonna be all that affordable over the medium term. And then from a grain grower perspective, you know, these costs have come down a little bit as 2022 came to an end. Um, but just, you know, anhydrous, all these costs are sky high. There's gonna be some relief there, but we're still gonna be way above average in 2023. And I think to the point about those net farm incomes, you know, I think that I think that you know, producers, growers, are gonna face the full impact of those high costs in this calendar year, where I think they only, they only experienced partial inflation in 2022. So milk production, we think we're gonna be positive um, milk production from here to July, uh, and then we see it turning negative again. I think, that, so we went from low margins at the end of 21, pushing milk production down in 22, high prices, Margins higher, pushing milk production up here, late 22, early 23, and I think we're flipping the cycle again. So we don't see milk production out of control, you know, up 3% or anything like that because of, you know, the cycle flipped pretty quick, base excess programs, drought, et cetera, fewer animals, all those things. I think the next big, situa big deal is the global dairy situation. Um, it's a pretty amazing story. Record U.S. dairy exports in 2022. And sometimes that happens in low price environments, like we're the cheapest at low prices and great we could export. We were the cheapest in the world for big parts of 2022, but we still had high prices. So we're gonna export, we estimate 9.5 billion pounds, 9.5 billion dollars worth of dairy products in 2022, uh, about 2.8 million metric tons. Um, so up 27% versus five years ago, 33% 10 years ago, 300% versus 20 years ago. This is a great story. You know, we're exporting, depending on how you want to measure, 15 to 20% of US milk, US milk production today. Now we're gonna have to keep doing that. And I think the big story, you know, well, so last year, milk production, big three, US, New Zealand, uh, Europe, down, right? That created the opportunity. Now we see Europe up, the US up. New Zealand's still down but the global milk output is looking a little bit better. So all the opportunity we exploited in 2022 was because Europe was limping, New Zealand was limping. But now Europe's got milk again. I think New Zealand is done. I mean, I mean I should, 
New Zealand is going to struggle to maintain its grip on dairy exports going forward. For one thing, look at their herd number. They're, they're, they are past peak, you know, we heard this for a long time, that oh, New Zealand's past peak milk. And I, th I think it's about maybe true. Look at the cow numbers this year in 2022, down quite a bit. Now, we've taken some cows, we've taken least, less productive cows or less productive operations out because milk production isn't down by as much as the cows are. But still, this is gonna be hard to come back from because it's structural. Um, November milk output is getting was better, minus 1.7%. The weather's good in New Zealand right now. So I think we'll see New Zealand milk production perform better as the months go forward. But if you're having a big wow, march in New Zealand milk production, it's really kind of a consolation prize, right? Because we missed the peak. You know, yeah, we're gonna pile on some extra pounds here in, in the, this part of the year, but really it's not, it's not a, you know, missing the peak is a bigger deal than making, you can't make up the ground in May that you lost in October, I guess is the easiest way to say it. So in New Zealand, we're kind of shoving it off to the side a little bit. But Europe is bouncing back. Uh, we're up 1%-ish you know, in October. We see the Netherlands up 2 3%. We see Germany up quite a bit. Poland has been good. Ireland has come back. And one thing to keep in mind about Europe and milk is that Europe is six times the size of New Zealand. It is 1.6 times the size of the US in terms of milk production. So if we're at plus one or 2% in Europe, it's the equivalent of New Zealand being up six to 12%. So you know, we're not gonna have a, it's, it's not a problem if New Zealand milk production is down a little bit if Europe is going pretty strong. And if you look at prices, so last year at this time, this was the price in New Zealand, this was the price in Europe, and this was the price in the United States. And then this summer, we got cheap again versus our competitors. That's when we booked all those pounds that pushed US cheese exports to record levels in 2022. Same thing with butter, right? We were expensive-ish, but we weren't, you know, look at European prices got way up here. But now look at what's happened. Woo. New Zealand, under two bucks. Europe, suddenly cheaper than the US. Uh, today, European cheese actually came in for the first time cheaper than the US. So we've gone from being the cheapest dairy products in the world to kind of the most expensive dairy products in the world, and it happened, you know, pretty, at the end of the year to now. And so we are not likely booking exports as aggressively today as we were last year at this time. And when you look at it, this graph shows the change in exports versus the change in, in block cheddar prices. So in years where we have exports ahead of the year prior levels by good amounts, we tend to have higher prices. We've only had one, two, three, four, five years when exports went down. And in four of those five years, prices were down quite a bit as well. So from a price perspective for 2023, um, it's really important that we export a lot of cheese. And I don't think we're gonna get off to a great start. We're gonna come very close to a billion pounds when the numbers are in for 2022. Pretty remarkable. And so if you said, hey, look, we're gonna export 70 million pounds of cheese a month, Five years ago, you'd say, well, that's a great accomplishment. But in 2022, we exported 83 million pounds a month. And so the question for the marketplace is, if you have 10 to 15 million pounds a month that's not going off, you know, out of the country, what are we gonna do with it? And I think that creates challenges price-wise. Just broadly speaking, I've been telling clients, look, if we're exporting 70 million pounds of cheese a month, 65, 70 million pounds of cheese a month, we're gonna have a $1.75 kind of market, $1.80. And if we're exporting 85 million again, it's gonna be a $2 kind of market. It might be that simple. And we're gonna get off to a slow start. Um, I think from a powders perspective, um, one of the issues is that China has been getting a little bit more self-sufficient. China milk production, pretty strong here in 2022. And 2021 was bit way above 2020. We see a lot of vertical integration in China. We see a lot of rotation out of small farms into larger farms. And you know, China's role as a major importer, I think is challenged by this. And if you look at you know, stockpiles, I mean, they're not, they were longer earlier in 2022. Um, but 
Um, powders, and powder stocks in China are in pretty good shape. There was an article in the Beijing Business News or something a couple weeks ago about how some smaller farms in China, I mean, they've really fallen on hard times. They're dumping milk. They're killing cows. Um, I think you know, China tends to overdo things. So that could create some near-term opportunities. If they kill too many cows, that could create some opportunities. But I think China is going to be less reliable, maybe, as a big importer. I get the sense when I talk to people today that they're waiting for, like, China's lurking. And then all of a sudden, they're going to jump out from behind the bushes and buy all the powder in the world. Um, I just don't sense that that's where we are today. I think they're going to increase their purchases. We just don't see it as a big bang. Um, Long term, I think the U.S. has tremendous opportunity in the export. You know, so, all right, so today, you know, look at the price charts. We're not in first place. Um, you know, we're going to struggle a little bit. But I think the situation in Europe is very interesting. The Netherlands, the mighty Netherlands. So we had, you know, incremental increases in milk production. What happened in, in this time frame here? European quotas went away, right? I mean, the Netherlands went crazy, right? They went, milk production went from here to here in a very short amount of time as quotas went away. But what's happened since then? Oh no, we're coming down. Why are we coming down in, in European milk production, Netherlands, France, Germany, et cetera? What's the situation there? It's environmental regulation for the most part, right? Cutting down on nitrogen. I mean, you know, they want to they cut down the New Netherlands dairy herd by about a third, I believe. Um, and so we've reached, so it's almost like a, it's almost like a new quota system that's been put in place uh, from the environmental side of the, the street. And if you look at export market share going back to 2004, the EU has been the world leader in global dairy trade. But this number started to come down in 2021. I think it's going to come down a little bit more in 2022. And the USA, you know, we got a little work to do to catch New Zealand, but we've closed the gap. And again, New Zealand is losing cows too. So I think that we are in a pretty, you know, we are in a strong position for the next three to five years for exports. <laughs> but I, I just, before we spike the football, I do want to talk about a little bit about what's going on in Europe and how it's kind of, it's both amusing and sad to see people commit economic suicide. Um, all this is, the, is climate stuff in Europe. A lot of it is climate stuff. And this is kind of a fascinating chart. And, and follow along with me. So if you look at European production of primary energy by fuel type, renewables have gone from, this is an index. So we've grown renewable fuel production in Europe by 30% since 2011. And if you look at total energy production, we're producing 20% less energy in Europe than we were. Why? Well, I mean, let's, I mean, wind doesn't, you can't, I mean, windmills don't, you need a lot of windmills to replace a coal plant, right? So we are net energy loss. Meanwhile, the US has been growing its energy, right? I, so I think that we're at a very interesting point in time because the Russia's invasion of the Ukraine kind of puts a little pivotal moment out there. Because if you're in Germany going into this winter and Putin rolls into the Ukraine and he's got his hand on the natural gas valve into Europe, are you thinking any differently about the path you've chosen? I think in Europe, I think they said, hey, look, you know what? Put a tarp over that coal pile. We don't want anybody to see it, but, but don't get rid of it just yet, just in case, right? But I don't know how that's going to turn out, because Europe's going to be OK. The weather turned warm. And this is, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to take a two-minute detour here, and then we'll get, we'll get the questions soon enough. Anybody here of Maslow's hierarchy of need? If you just think about where we are in this country, where we are in the world on some of these things with COVID and Russia, Ukraine, and energy, um, you know, Maslow said, these are the things that we need in our life. You know, we've, we've got to get the basics covered. We need food, shelter, water. And then if we get that covered, then we can look at safety, et cetera. And if, you know, if we're warm and we have a good house, we can look for belonging and love. 
And all the way at the top where, this, where it's self-actualization, where we can care about the, the extras, let's say. I think before COVID, we were operating up here at the very top. Just think about the food evolution in the United States, right? You know, where we have these sort of evolving orthodoxies about, you know, we go from, okay, we want organic milk because that's better for you. And then we want, not, and then we want grass-fed organic milk because that's even better than what's better for you. And then we want milk, hand-milked cows or whatever the latest fad is because that's even better for everybody, right? Well, you can do that when the economy is growing great, when there's food on every plate, you know, when unemployment is low, um, in really good economic times, you can live up here. You can care about the frou-frou stuff. When Putin's leaning on your natural gas valve, you know, how far down, or, or COVID, how far down this ladder have we come? And I just think it's interesting to think about in the context of is Europe going to continue marching on? Because at the end of the day, there's only one way. I mean, Europe is going to deal with either high-priced food, less food, less people, or all of the above. Good news for us, but I wouldn't be 100% so satisfied that we're not going to be just as um, ambitious uh, here in the United States. So I just think this is just think about this, right? COVID was a back-to-basics moment. We poured cereal in the bowl and sat down at the table, right? And then how quickly, how, where are we as a society? And I think energy has, is, does a big deal with that. So I don't know. Thank you for indulging my, um, I just think it's a culturally, right? Some of this food stuff is about culture. It's, it's, and it's about dollars and cents. And it's about, hey, look, yeah, you know, I want, I want the high end, super climate friendly product if I can afford it, if it's the difference between not eating and not eating, you know, where am I at on all that? All right, critical factors, U.S. economy. I'll go through this quickly. Um, I think consumers are approaching 2023 cautiously. Stock market was down 20% last year. What does that mean for people on fixed incomes? Um, younger folks who spent big when Tesla was at $30 a share. So buck 25 now. Inflation's a big deal. Consumer sentiment is not as low as it was at the worst of 2022, but it's not great. So I think consumers are eh, sour. The job market remains good if you're an employee, not if you're an employer. There's still a pretty big gap between the number of unemployed people and job openings. Um, earnings have been going up, not at the rate of inflation, but they've been going up. But then here we have this manufacturing and services data last month that shows contraction. Employment is a lagging indicator. Recessions cause unemployment. Unemployment doesn't cause recessions. And when you start seeing these factory numbers kind of, we're going to see more, you know, 10,000 Microsoft workers, I think yesterday I saw, or today, getting laid off. So this jobs thing is evolving in a sideways to negative way, which is not good for consumer spending. The good news is we got a big break on energy. People who work with me know I'm obsessed with the price of gasoline as a indicator of consumer spending power. When gasoline was $5 a gallon nationally this summer, I thought, oh boy, this is gonna be a real, real problem because dollars spent at the gas station and dollars not spent at restaurants or on, on fancy things, if you will. Um, but now gasoline's cheaper, heating oil came down, natural gas came down. Um, I think that's friendly consumer spending in the near term. But if you see crude oil get to 100 bucks again, I think, eh, you know, things get a little dicey again from a consumer spending perspective. So I'm neutral here. I'm not as bearish in the economy as some of my peers, but I think we're vulnerable. And I think that you know, consumers are cutting back. And I think that the middle class and lower classes are getting crushed by inflation today. All right, so gasoline is cheaper. That's great. Food prices are up 10 to 15%, and that hits home. And if you look at the inflation data, retail sales data came out this morning. If you look at it, grocery sales, this is dollar sales. And this is the actual adjusted for inflation. We're taking less out of the grocery store. The rate of inflation is outpacing the rate of, of dollar growth. But Americans are still dining out. These numbers have been OK. DoorDash. So one of the things I always talk about is never underestimate the laziness of the American consumer. 
I'm not proud of this, okay? I live in Cottage Grove, Wisconsin. I could walk, I mean literally, I can walk to the McDonald's. I mean it is, it is not even a long walk, it's about, it's a mile-ish. My wife and I, my daughter's home from college, my wife and I went someplace, <laughs> and my, my 18 year old daughter door dashed McDonald's. Like, you know, like a mile, she could have gone, she could have driven a mile, she could have walked a mile, and she paid a door dash, she paid door dash whatever, not my money thankfully, um, you know, to get food. So even though things are a little tighter, we still, you know, food service is okay, delivery services are okay, um, I, I never, it's, it might be the smart, I, I haven't said many smart things, mind you, but this might be the smartest thing I've ever said, you know, because I, it's always proven correct. So if it's convenient, we're gonna go for it. All right, so what? Um, I think the cheese market's trying to decide. It gets over $2, people wanna sell it. It gets under $2, people wanna buy it on blocks. But barrels are in a downtrend, and I think this is because of lost exports, personally. But bull markets have long tails. It's gonna get cheaper, people are gonna refill their stocks a little bit, we're gonna kinda of chop down. Butter market came down 90 cents. The only time butter at 240 a pound is not expensive is when you've been to 325. Right? Butter's cheap today because it's not $3. I think people are reloading, but at some point they're gonna say, all right, we have enough and we're gonna go down a little bit. I keep thinking the non-fat dry milk market is done going lower uh, and I, am humiliated every day. Like, I think this morning I was on a call with a client and I said, you know, I'd go buy June non-fat futures. And, you know, then the spot market went down, what, three cents today, I think? Um, so, I think we're done almost going down here on non-fat, but the world markets are, are suffering a little bit. I think this is something that's interesting to look at. When you look at, we call it synthetic pricing, we look at spot prices in Europe, US, and New Zealand. So US is kind of, the, you know, $19 per hundredweight class three is kind of the cheapest in the world right now, ways included in that. But look at that New Zealand class four prices, $17 a hundredweight, we're coming down. I think we're gonna struggle a little bit on class four. Our forecast, we think we're gonna have some seasonal weakness down towards this $18 level. I don't think we have a lot of tolerance for less than $18 milk and we're gonna end the year uh, back, you know, this is just a seasonal kind of movement. We're gonna, we're gonna be strong in milk until the summer, and then we're gonna have, all of a sudden we're gonna have fewer cows again, and we'll have bought back some demand, and I think we're gonna get to more comfortable milk price levels as the year comes to a close. All right, I'm gonna take a breath. Um, any questions? So we have about five minutes or so for questions. There's a microphone right here, and I've been encouraged, you're strongly encouraged, to kind of, kind of come up and use the microphone if you have any questions. Or I can repeat your questions for, go ahead. So the question is uh, about the exports, um, how is currency playing a role in that, right? Would be a good way to summarize the question. So the, the dollar was strong in 2022. Rallied almost all, it rallied into like September. It didn't help for sure, right? Because as the dollar goes up, um, it makes our product more expensive in other currencies. And if you look at some of the currencies that got beat up a little bit in Asia, right? Their purchasing power went down. Um, so it hurt us, but really, uh, the bigger challenge is who has product and who doesn't, right? I mean, Europe didn't have the product either for a while. Neither did New Zealand. So, yes, currency was a, was a headwind in 2022. I don't think it's quite a tailwind just yet, but the dollar is, you know, what, six or seven percent off its highs, and if interest rates are kind of kind of coming down, you know, I think the dollar is probably, you know, there's a good chance the dollar has passed its peak which would be net good for U.S. dairy exports. The bad news is that European milk production is up 2%. It doesn't really matter what the euro is versus the dollar. Or, or you know, if there's too much milk in Europe, currency can only help you so much, if that's a fair way to say it. Any other, yes? Has China become more self-sufficient self through the export of the 
So the question is, as China becomes more self-sufficient, who is the export cu uh, customer of the future? I think that Africa is what we always talk about. Uh, again, now, you've got you know, a billion people in China. I mean, you've got lots of people in China, and you, you know, Africa is not that, you know, it's not the same. But there's still a lot of runway for economic growth and development in, in Africa. I think that's one of the next big markets. I still think there's room to run in the Middle East. Um, you know, we've seen dairy development there, but it's, it's tough going. Um, and those populations are still growing. Um, I think the challenge in China, too, is that population, we saw it this week, China's population is going down. I think India, I think India has some potential, but historically has been very, very protectionist on dairy. They don't let anything in the country unless it's absolutely, absolutely necessary. So we'd have to see things shift quite a bit politically or economically in, you know, in India. But India's population is still growing. So I think that offers at least theoretical opportunity out there. And I don't know, South, I mean, Mexico is still growing um, and it's still a good market for us. And the Mexican dairy industry, I don't think is gonna be any more self-sufficient than it's been. Uh, yes, again, sorry. What about the corn and bean market for this coming summer? Well, um, I'm just going to go back. I, I don't know. I mean, I think that demand matters, right? I think we've, you know, we've lost some demand. I'm just going to go back to one of these price charts, so forgive me. I just think that we're likely to be somewhere between 550 and 650 corn. I mean, I'm just picking a number. I mean, I, you know, if we grow a reasonable crop, if we, if we don't run into immediate trouble this spring, and we're just going to watch things kind of go along. I think we could see 550 on the low side, and then you know 650 on the high side. Um, but if you know if it doesn't rain, or if it's you know if it's too something in a major serious way, then I think we're 750 on corn, and I think we're you know 15, 16 dollars on beans. I would say I would take the under on 2023 versus 2022 today, because I think that we're due for a good crop. I think the weather patterns are changing. South America is going to be helpful a little bit, um, but I don't see. I don't see those markets. We are. We have like. I don't know. I don't know what the right word is. There's at least one. We need at least one crop of safety, if you will. Right. We have not had a good. We've had okay crops. We haven't killed any crops, but we haven't had like a safety crop in a while. And so I think that we're one good crop away from saying, oh. All right, now this can be a 450 market again. I just don't, I just don't see us getting there anytime soon. You know, over the next six to 12 months. And for beans, I guess that number would be what? Thir you know, I mean, a sub 13 dollars. I think we need a big crop in South America. We need a big crop here, and confidence that we've got enough before we can see those kind of numbers. I think on the upside, though, I think we, you know, I, I'd be surprised if we saw numbers higher. You know, it's going, to take a, it's going to take an event to put numbers higher than the highs here, you know, the, the, the Putin highs that we saw um, this spring, if that makes sense. And then the other one to watch is meal, right? Because there's all this talk about biodiesel. We're going to be crushing more, you know, creating more soybean oil. That's going to be great for meal. That's probably true over three to five years. I think over the near term, I mean, meal, we were telling people to buy it if they saw it under $400, I, you know, but that's been elusive. Um, I think meal somewhere in the 350 to 450 area is probably something you can count on. Maybe 425, 475. I think we have time for one more question. So the question is, you know, in light of very of tight cattle supplies, bird flu, um, other factors, you know, from a feeding perspective, right? We're, we're presumably losing bushels into feed. Um, I guess that I would say the market knows that today, right? I, I mean, I think that the cattle contraction is the worst kept secret in America, right? I mean, it's obvious where we're going. So I, I you know, I guess the question I would ask about that is, where's the surprise? Is the, I guess the surprise is that the drought goes on, you know, it gets even worse, as hard as that is to imagine. Um, so I would say, yeah, it's clearly a factor, but I think we'd have to have a, a, an event of some magnitude to surprise the market, because no one really expects 
you know, we're, we're just not going to, you know, we're just not going to, we're not going to have, we're not going to lose a lot of cattle overnight necessarily, and, and we're certainly not going to have a lot of them appear overnight, right? Um, so I think that's, it's one of those tricky things where it's definitely a factor and it definitely matters, but it's hard to know where the surprise is in the marketplace because it's already pretty well known. All right, well, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks to Balkem for sponsoring this session and uh, really appreciate the questions and your attention. And if uh, you have any questions, um, I'm gonna be here for a few minutes. Katie, one of my colleagues is here in the room. Um, happy to talk to you. And uh, Ryan, one another one of my colleagues here. So a few folks in the room, if you have any questions, happy to talk to you. Thank you very much for your time today.